My name's Julie. Life threw me a curveball when I was just nine. Dad had been sick for a while, but I didn't really get what was happening until he was gone for good. One day he was there, the next day just an empty space at the dinner table. Mom didn't take long to fill that space. Within a few months, she brought home Frank. I guess loneliness hits hard and fast. Frank moved in like he owned the place, and it was clear he wasn't keen on having me around. Julie, this is Frank. Frank, this is my daughter, Julie. Mom introduced us the day he moved in. His look was cold, like he'd rather be anywhere else, but here looking at me. Hi, I managed, a bit shy, but trying to be polite. Frank just nodded, didn't even smile. He turned to mom. Sarah, can we talk about the living arrangements? I remember feeling a chill as they walked away, his hand on her shoulder. It wasn't long before I started feeling like an outsider. Frank had rules for everything, and he was always on my case. Don't leave your stuff in the living room, eat faster, or too much noise. It was relentless. Mom did nothing. She just nodded along with whatever Frank said, her eyes empty, or maybe just tired. One evening, things boiled over at dinner. I had accidentally knocked over a glass of water, and it spilled towards Frank. Clumsy kid, can't you do anything right? Frank snapped, jumping up as the water splashed his pants. Sorry, Frank, it was just an accident, I stammered, feeling my face heat up. Sorry doesn't clean up messes, Julie. Be more careful, he scolded, his voice raised, more than necessary. Mom just sat there, dabbing her mouth with a napkin, silent. I looked at her, hoping she'd say something, anything in my defense. But nothing came. After dinner, I heard them arguing in their room. Frank's voice was loud and harsh. Sarah, that kid of yours, needs to shape up. I'm not gonna live in chaos just because you're used to it. Mom's reply was soft, but I caught bits of it. Frank, please. She's just a child. She's still adjusting. Adjusting? It's been months. I'm telling you, if things don't change. I didn't hear the rest, but I didn't need to. The message was clear. Frank wanted me out of the way, and Mom wasn't fighting too hard against the idea. The next few months were just as tough. Frank's complaints were a daily soundtrack, and Mom's silence grew heavier. I was walking on eggshells, trying not to make a sound, disappear if I could. But you can't disappear in your own home, can you? Even a nine-year-old knows that much. Life at home got trickier when Mom told us she was expecting. Frank already had his hands full just tolerating me, and the news didn't exactly make him jump for joy. He was silent for a long minute before he spoke, and when he did, his words were clipped and cold. Well, that's just great, Sarah. Just what we needed, he said, his tone dripping with something that sounded a lot like sarcasm. Mom just smiled, a bit too weakly. It's a blessing, Frank. You'll see. A fresh start for us. I remember feeling a mix of excitement and dread. A little brother or sister seemed like a dream, someone new to connect with, but with Frank's mood swings, I wasn't so sure. Months flew by, and the baby finally arrived. It was a girl, and they named her Anna. I was thrilled. She was tiny, and when I first saw her, all wrapped up in her pink blanket, my heart melted. I thought having Anna around might make things better, even make Frank soften up a bit. Holding Anna felt magical. She was so small, her tiny fingers grasping at nothing. Hey there, Anna. I'm your big sister, Julie. I'm gonna take good care of you. I whispered, promising silently to be there for her, no matter what. But the magic didn't last. Bringing Anna home changed the dynamics again. Frank was fussier than ever, especially about money. One night, about a week after Anna came home, I overheard him talking to mom in the kitchen. His voice was harsh, louder than it needed to be. More expenses, Sarah. Diapers, formula, God knows what else. And what about Julie? She's not even mine, and I'm footing the bill for her too? Mom's voice was a quiet murmur. Frank, please, she's just a child. We can manage. 
things will settle down. It's not just about managing, Sarah. It's about priorities. We need to think about our family now. Our real family. I knew what that meant. I wasn't real family. The sting of those words hit me hard. I slid down the wall, by my door, hugging my knees, trying not to cry. The final straw came when Frank sat us down in the living room one evening, his face serious, his eyes avoiding mine. Sarah, we need to think about the future. Julie's getting older, and expenses are piling up. Maybe it's time she went to live with her Aunt Claire. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Sent away? Just like that? Mom finally spoke, looking at me, her eyes sad. Julie, honey, it might not be so bad. Aunt Claire has a nice house, and you'll be well taken care of. But Mom, I don't want to go. I want to stay here with you and Anna. The room went silent. Frank's next words were cold and final. It's decided then. I'll call Claire in the morning. Moving in with Aunt Claire was like stepping into a different world. Her house was big, clean, and always silent. Too silent for comfort. The first day I arrived, she laid down her laws like we were setting terms for a peace treaty after a long war. You'll follow my rules under my roof, Julie. No nonsense, no mess, no backtalk, she declared as she led me through the hall to what would be my room. The room was plain, with bare walls and a single bed against the corner. It felt nothing like home. I nodded, too tired and too upset to argue. Homework right after school, chores before dinner, and lights out by nine. I won't tolerate any laziness or sloppiness, you hear? Aunt Claire continued, her voice firm. Yes, Aunt Claire. I responded, my voice a whisper. Speak up when you're spoken to. Let's have no mumbling here. She snapped. I quickly corrected my tone. Yes, Aunt Claire. I understand. The days that followed blended into each other, each as strict and unforgiving as the last. Aunt Claire was tough, tougher than anyone I'd ever known. She had a way of making simple conversations feel like interrogations. Homework was a battlefield too. If I got a B instead of an A, Aunt Claire had words that stung sharper than any I'd heard before. You can do better than this. Your laziness won't fly here. She'd scold, even though I'd spent hours poring over books. The worst was how she reminded me of my mom's decision to send me away. If I dared to talk back or ask for less criticism, she'd retort sharply, no wonder your mom sent you here. You need discipline you obviously weren't getting. Those words hurt. They always did. They made me feel unwanted, unloved, like I was just another problem mom had to solve by shipping me off. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months. I learned to keep my head down, do as told, and speak only when necessary. Aunt Claire had no patience for tears or complaints, and I had no energy left to fight. It's for your own good, she'd often say after a particularly harsh scolding, as if the sting of her words was supposed to mold me into someone better. I wasn't sure who that better person was supposed to be. All I knew was I was getting really good at being alone, at being quiet, at not being a problem. Because in Aunt Claire's house, not being a problem was the best thing you could be. Living with Aunt Claire was suffocating, and I found myself missing my mom more each day, even though I knew she had let me go without much of a fight. One afternoon, the longing got too much. Aunt Claire was out, probably at her bridge club, and I knew I had a couple of hours, at least. Her phone was always left on the kitchen counter, charging next to the fruit bowl. It seemed like my only link back to my old life. I hesitated for a minute before I picked it up. Dialing my mom's number was muscle memory, I hadn't forgotten it, maybe I never would. My heart was racing as I heard the phone ring. Once, twice, then her voice. Hello? Mom? It's me, Julie. There was a pause, a breath maybe, then, Julie, why are you calling? I swallowed hard, my throat tight. I just wanted to hear your voice. Another pause, longer this time. Then cold, hard, you shouldn't have called. But mom. 
Julie, listen to me. You need to stop this. I can't have you calling me. But why? I miss you, mom. I miss home. When can I come back? Her voice was flat, emotionless as if she was discussing the weather. You can't. That's done. Don't call here anymore. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mom, please. Just don't, Julie. There's nothing here for you. Goodbye. She hung up, and the line went dead. The silence in the kitchen was deafening. I felt my hands shake as I put the phone back on the charger. The finality in her voice broke something in me. She didn't want me. She really didn't want me anymore. Tears blurred my vision as I stumbled to my room. I closed the door softly, not wanting to make any noise that might hint at my rebellion. I sat on the floor, my back against my bed, and let myself cry. The room felt smaller than ever, a box that was slowly closing in on me. About an hour later, I heard the front door open and close. Aunt Claire's voice called out. Julie? You better have finished your chores. Yes, Aunt Claire. I called back, wiping my eyes quickly with the back of my hand. I didn't want her to see any signs of weakness. Weakness was not tolerated here. I went to the kitchen to help with dinner as if nothing had happened, but inside, I was different. I felt emptier, more alone. Mom's voice, those final words, played over and over in my head. That night, Aunt Claire discovered the call log on her phone. Her face twisted into a scowl as she stormed into my room, her voice a harsh whisper that cut through the quiet. So, you took my phone to call your mother? Thought you'd go behind my back? I froze, the blood draining from my face. I, I just wanted to hear her voice. Aunt Claire laughed, a harsh, grating sound. And what did that get you, huh? She doesn't want you, Julie. Even you can't deny it now. Her words were like ice, and I felt them chill me to the bone. She grabbed my arm, her grip tight and painful. No more phone. No more pity parties. You're here because she doesn't want you. Remember that. The punishment was severe. More chores, stricter rules, and the cold shoulder from Aunt Claire, who made sure every day thereafter that I felt just how unwanted I was. Aunt Claire's house had become a prison, each day dragging, heavier than the last. It was clear I was nothing but a burden to her, a nuisance she tolerated only because she had to. But even that thin thread of obligation snapped one chilly morning a year into my stay. You're packing your bags today, Julie, Aunt Claire announced over breakfast, her voice stern and final. I stared at her, spoon halfway to my mouth. What? Why? Your mother stopped sending money. No money, no reason to keep you here. She replied bluntly, sipping her coffee as if we were discussing something as trivial as the weather. I felt a cold dread settle in my stomach. So, what happens to me now? She shrugged, a cold, dismissive gesture. Not my problem. You can go live with your grandmother. If she won't take you, then it's the orphanage. The thought of going to an orphanage terrified me, but the mention of grandma sparked a tiny flicker of hope. I hadn't seen her since I was little, barely remembered her, but surely she wouldn't turn me away. Packing my bags felt surreal, like I was stripping away layers of my life at Aunt Claire's, each item a reminder of the year I'd lost. Aunt Claire drove me to Grandma's, the car ride silent except for the hum of the engine. We arrived at a modest house, smaller and cozier than Aunt Claire's imposing place. Grandma was waiting at the door, her expression unreadable. This is Julie, your granddaughter, Aunt Claire said, not bothering with niceties. I can't keep her anymore. Sarah stopped paying. Grandma looked me over, her eyes sharp but not unkind. I see. Come in, Julie. Aunt Claire didn't linger. With a brief nod, she left, her duty discarded as easily as she'd disposed of me. Inside, Grandma's house was warm, filled with the scent of cinnamon and something sweet baking. It felt welcoming, a stark contrast to Aunt Claire's sterile environment. You'll be staying in the guest room. I suppose we'll need to sort out some more permanent arrangements, Grandma said, leading me down the hall. 
The guest room was small, with a window overlooking the garden. It felt safe, a word I hadn't associated with a place in a long time. Thank you, Grandma, I said, my voice low, still unsure of my welcome. She nodded. We're family, Julie. You belong here more than anywhere else. Over the next few weeks, I adjusted to life with Grandma. It was different. She was strict, but there was a kindness to her rules, a gentleness in her reprimands. You need to do your chores, Julie. Everyone contributes here. She would remind me, but her tone was patient, not harsh. Yes, Grandma, I would respond, grateful for her fair approach. Living with Grandma, I began to heal. I found solace in the quiet routine of our days, the peaceful nights, and the steady rhythm of life that was so different from the chaos with Aunt Claire. The months rolled by, and on my 16th birthday, Grandma made a decision that would seal our bond forever. Over breakfast, she slid an envelope across the table to me. Take a look at this, Julie, she said, her voice carrying a mix of seriousness and warmth. I opened the envelope, pulling out some official-looking papers. What's this? It's adoption papers, Julie. I want to adopt you. Make things official, so no one can ever make you feel unwanted again. She explained, watching me closely, for my reaction. I felt a lump form in my throat. Really, Grandma? You mean it? Yes, I do. You're not just staying here, Julie. You're my family, and it's time we made that clear to everyone else too. A few weeks later, it was done. We went to court, and I officially became Julie Bennett, with a new sense of belonging that I had longed for since mom sent me away. With grandma's support, I started looking towards the future. She encouraged me to focus on my studies, particularly science, which had always fascinated me. You've got a sharp mind for it, Julie. You could go into medicine. How would you like that? She suggested one day as we were going over some of my school projects. I'd love that, Grandma. I want to help people. I replied, the idea taking root. Then it's settled. We'll get you into a good college program. I'll support you every step of the way. She declared, her determination, clear. True to her word, Grandma was there for me throughout my high school years. She tutored me in math and science, using her old-school methods that were strict, but effective. You need to understand the basics, Julie. Can't skip the foundation. She'd insist whenever I struggled with complex problems. I graduated with top marks, thanks to her unwavering support. Grandma then helped me navigate the daunting college applications process. When I got accepted into a medical college with a partial scholarship, she was as proud as if she'd received the acceptance herself. We'll manage the finances. Don't you worry about that, Grandma said when I fretted over the costs. You focus on your studies. Become the best doctor you can be. Medical school was tough, but fulfilling. I was drawn to oncology, the branch of medicine that dealt with cancer. It was hard, emotionally and intellectually, but it felt right, like I was exactly where I needed to be. I completed my degree, then my internship, and finally, my residency, each step a milestone that Grandma celebrated. You're making a real difference, Julie. I'm so proud of you, she'd say, her eyes shining with pride. By the time I turned 32, I was fully established in my career as an oncologist. My life was busy but fulfilling, filled with long hours at the hospital and the satisfaction of knowing I was making a difference. Through it all, Grandma was my anchor, always there to listen and offer advice on tough days. But life, as it often does, threw another curveball my way. Grandma's health, which had been declining, took a turn for the worse. It was swift and unexpected, the kind of decline that leaves you scrambling to catch your breath. I remember coming home one evening, tired after a particularly tough day at the hospital. Grandma was sitting in her favorite armchair, looking out the window. Her voice was weaker when she called me over. Julie, come sit with me for a bit, she said, patting the chair next to her. I sat down, taking her hand in mine. It felt fragile, like a dried leaf that might crumble under too much pressure. I'm not going to beat around the bush, she started, her tone serious. 
The doctors, they say it's not much time now. We need to talk about things, practical things. The lump in my throat grew, my eyes stung with tears. Grandma, please. She squeezed my hand, her grip still strong. No tears now, Julie. We've got things to sort out. You need to be ready. The next few weeks were a blur of doctor's visits, late nights, and legal paperwork. Grandma wanted to ensure everything was in order for me, that there would be no complications with her estate or her wishes. When the end came, it was peaceful. Grandma passed away in her sleep, at home, just as she'd wanted. The emptiness her passing left was palpable, a silence in the house that was too heavy to bear at times. Planning the funeral was hard. I went through her address book, calling relatives and friends. The responses were polite, some even warm, but it became clear that not many would make the effort to come. My heart ached, not just for the loss of grandma, but for the loneliness of this farewell. The funeral day was quiet, the chapel more empty than not. I stood there, feeling oddly detached as the priest spoke about life, loss, and legacy. It didn't take long after the funeral when the past I thought I'd left behind came knocking at my door. My mother, stepfather, and their daughter, who was now 20 years old, showed up unexpectedly. My mother didn't waste any time. Julie, you need to share the inheritance your grandmother left you, she demanded, her tone entitled. I stared at them, disbelief mixing with anger. You left me, remember? Twenty years ago, you decided I was too much of a burden. My mother's face twisted into a sneer. Ungrateful girl. Now you're a rich doctor with an inheritance. You owe us. I laughed, the sound bitter. Grandma adopted me. Legally, you're nothing to me now. The shock on her face was almost comical. My stepfather, ever the bully, leaned in. You're going to regret this, Julie. As they left, I slammed the door behind them, the click of the lock sounding unusually satisfying. Standing there, my back against the door, I felt a mix of relief and renewed determination. A few days after their first visit, I was at work when I got a call from a neighbor. Julie, it looks like your family's at your house again. They've been bringing in furniture, looks like they're moving in or something. When I pulled into the driveway, the sight of their car parked out front made my stomach churn. I walked in to find my mother, stepfather, and stepsister unpacking boxes in the living room, acting as if they owned the place. What are you doing? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. My mother turned around, feigning surprise. Oh, Julie. We're just settling in. After all, this is family property. No, it's not. This is my house, legally left to me by grandma. You need to leave. Now. My stepfather stepped forward, a smirk on his face. Make us. We're family, and we deserve a part of this house. I could feel the rage bubbling inside me. You haven't been family for over 20 years. You can't just come here and claim what's mine. My stepsister, watching from the side, finally piped up. Come on, Julie, don't be so heartless. We're just asking for what's fair. Fair? I laughed, the sound sharp and bitter. What's fair about abandoning a child? What's fair about only showing up when you think there's money to be had? They had no answers, just scowls and muttered curses. I'm calling the police, I declared, pulling out my phone. My mother tried to stop me. You'll regret this, Julie. I've regretted knowing you for years. This is nothing new. I shot back as I dialed 911. The police arrived quickly. I explained the situation, showing them the legal documents, proving my ownership of the house and grandma's will. The officers were firm. You need to leave, one of them told my mother and stepfather. This property doesn't belong to you, and if you don't comply, you'll be removed forcibly. My stepfather glared at me, his anger clear, but there was nothing he could do. This isn't over, Julie, he threatened as they gathered their things. Oh, but it is, I replied, my tone cold and final. After they were gone, I walked through the house, through grandma's house. 
Each room was filled with memories, each corner a testament to her love and the life she had built here, a life she had fought to pass on to me. Standing in her favorite spot by the window, I made a promise, not just to her, but to myself. I would not let the bitterness of the past tarnish my future. I had fought hard to become who I was, and I would continue to fight, to honor her legacy and the sacrifices she had made for me.